Hey, what's up guys? Nick the Informative Fisherman here, and today I'm gonna to be covering common fishing questions. I came up with a few of my own, but then I said, you know what? I'm gonna go on my Facebook, ask some people, so I compiled some questions from there that I thought I could slip into here, and uh, other ones kind of fit under the full episode category, so we won't elaborate. The first question I had was how to find fish. It's a very generalized question. You could be a person looking to catch catfish or a person catching, looking to catch bass. I mean, it's completely different. First thing you need to know is the type of fish you're going after. Whether it's a scavenger being catfish, does it have whiskers, uh, are the eyes lower? Is it designed for uh, scavenging and eating stuff? Or is it a predator species? Is their eyes on top of their head? Will they chase lures? Do they run down bait fish? These, this is the info you have to know. You could type in the type of fish you're looking for on Wikipedia, but if not, I'll tell you, pretty much anywhere in the world there's some sort of species of catfish. Uh, you can put bait down there, you can look up my brain rigging video, how to brain rig. If you click here on the bottom, it'll take you to a part of a video um, that shows how to do it with chicken livers and circle hooks and sticky thread. Really simple process will pretty much catch you scavenger catfish anywhere in the world. Um, for predator species, here's the thing you have to know. Predator species follow the bait fish around. Um, in the spring, the bait fish are up near the bank. In the summer, the bait fish are out uh, deeper, so therefore, those fish in the spring are going to be shallower that want to eat that bait fish. In the middle of the summer, they're going to be deeper or in and around heavy cover. Um, basically, getting shade, the bait fish generally aren't out eating in the sun most of the time, unless they're bluegills, and they will. Um, from there, in the fall, the bait fish move back into the creeks, around the points, around creek mouths, and into flat, shallow areas once again. So in the fall, they're gonna be in that shallow area. Ooh, I just missed a fish over here. So that's where your bait fish is gonna be located. Let me see if I got this one right here real quick. Hold on one second, guys. So that's your bait fish intel. I'm out here drifting for, uh, drifting for pan fish at my house right now. So that's your little bait fish intel there for you. That's what you really want to know. Um, then from there, if, if you're fishing for like bass, or if you're fishing for musky, pike, walleye, oh, here's a big red here. Let me catch this one real quick. And there is a giant, giant red here on film for you guys at the same time. Now, this is a pan fish. And like I said, when you're searching for fish, a panfish is a scavenger slash predator. That's huge. That's an absolutely gigantic red ear right there. Wow, what a monster. But what I'm doing here is I'm drifting across. I'm using the boat and just drifting with the wind. I'm using the wind current and little, little tiny crappie jigs. This dude actually swallowed the jig off of there. All I have is the jig head left on there. Um, you know, but panfish like this, they eat little tiny grubs, little tiny worms, little tiny artificial plastics, um, you know, called grubs. They'll eat that. And basically, you want to go into your nearest tackle shop. You want to ask the guys, say, if you're just getting into fishing, you know, how, how do I catch these fish? You know, what are the most prevalent species around here? What should I use to go catch them? You want to go into these tackle shops, ask them for the gear, ask what you need, because no matter where you're at in the country, there's going to be a different type of fish. Let's let this big boy go here. Actually, let me put him in the live well box. I'll take some pictures more of them later. No matter where you go in the country, there's going to be a different type of popular species. For example, I'm in Northern California. People are like, Nick, do a video on walleye. I don't have walleye, unfortunately, so I can't do that yet until I travel to the Midwest or musky. But if you go into a local tackle shop and ask them, say, what do I need? What's the most prevalent species around here? If you're looking to catch a lot, say, I have kids, I need to catch a lot, and they'll get you introduced to the species. But when you get out there, how to find fish, a lot of people don't have it in their mindset that an overcast day is good. When you're first starting out fishing, they're like, oh, let's go, be let's go out here and fish a nice, beautiful, sunny day. A beautiful, sunny day, the light penetrates. Um, it's generally not too windy if you think it's a beautiful, sunny day. The fish are going to go down on the bottom. Therefore, it makes it harder to catch unless you're there in the morning or the evening. This is why a lot of people think morning and evening bite, great, great, great. It's, it's always good. Well, the problem is you tend to fish shallow. 
at that time so you fish fast so your baits near the surface of the water column where those fish go in the morning or the evening in the middle of a sunny day if you go on an overcast day like we are here the fish could be spread all over the place they're willing to run baits down further so that's a way to find fish go on an overcast day and you will find that they are more active fish that way um, also when you get out there and it's windy most people try to hide from the wind if you go to the spot where the wind's blowing, it's blowing microscopic bait, zooplankton, phytoplankton. It's blowing it all in there. Zooplankton are microorganisms that eat phytoplankton, which is just algae. It's all going to blow in there. Small fish are going to eat them. Therefore, the big fish are going to be there. So that's some more tips for you. Predator species love to be around things where they can ambush. Docks, posts, trees. They like to hide in there to ambush those smaller fish. Bigger scavengers like to generally be in the deeper areas next to those areas. If they're scavenging, they're eating dead stuff. They're rooting for clams. You know, you can look for those deeper holes, look for creek channels. Uh, you would have to use a map, something like Navionics, to show where those creek channels are. But hopefully that's a couple more tips to help you guys find fish. All right, guys. Now, how I caught that last one was on this little maniac minnow, little grub style swim bait here. This one's not nearly as big, but another nice one. And I got this guy on a little uh, gulp worm here. These are all on 164 ounce jig heads. I use the 164 ounce a lot of the time when I'm pan fishing because it's so light. You know, it just drifts over the grass, no problem. Another nice red ear. They, they just drift over the grass, no problem. They don't really get hung down in the grass. So when you're drifting, they work substantially well if you have an area with lots of grass. So in case you're wondering about that last one, that wasn't one of the questions, but there's another fish for you. Okay, now for one of the most common questions I get time after time after time is a bass fishing related question. Nick, if I'm getting started with one bait casting rod and reel combo, what should I do? And when I hear one rod, one reel, in bass fishing, you know, we have so many different techniques and so many different lures and specialized type of things that require a special rod. Um, eventually, you're going to want to get a bunch of rod and reels. But if I had to pick just one, it would be anywhere from seven foot to seven foot six. I would say if you're on the taller side, like above six foot, I would go with like a seven foot six rod. Uh, if you're below that, I would go with like a seven foot rod. It's just going to be a little easier for you guys to handle in a fast action, in a medium heavy power class. Um, you'll see that the rod can handle, you know, 12 or 10 to like 20 pound line on there. It'll show you on the rod, you know, just above where the handle connects. Um, a fast action rod is a rod that's going to bend up near the tip. It's not an extra fast where it's right in the very tip tip. It's a rod that's going to allow you the versatility to throw crankbaits, spinnerbaits, worms, and a medium heavy power is going to allow you to throw some of the lighter stuff and some of the heavier stuff. You're, you're aiming for the majority with this one rod and reel. Um, from there, the reel that you want is a minimal six speed reel and you're going to see uh, six to one to one or six three to one and all the six is or the five is or the seven is or the eight is is one rotation of the handles how many times your spool is going to rotate therefore you're going to pick up line faster with that higher number a five would be slower a six would be medium a seven would be faster from there i honestly suggest nowadays starting off with a seven speed reel a seven to one or a seven three to one it doesn't matter those are minuscule numbers in the overall sense of things the downside is if you're using a lure with a lot of resistance, like a crankbait pulling and resisting, it's, you're going to feel a lot of pressure because you're on a fast reel. Just tell yourself to slow down at that point if you feel a lot of extra tension. But a 7 speed reel, a medium heavy, 7 foot to 7 foot 6 depending on your overall height, that's going to help you with your pitching, your roll casting, your overhand casting. Um, from there, a versatile line. Um, there's a lot of different line choices out there and I'm going to get into that on another question but you want to start off with like a 12 pound line I say 12 to 15 if you live in an area where a big bass is three to four pounds start off with 12 pound line if you live in an area like I do around the California Delta start off with 15 pound test where we have behemoth bass and, and a lot of abrasion and a lot of heavy grass to where you could potentially break off but smaller bass Go with that 12, those giant behemoth bass, Texas bass, or Florida bass, or California bass, start off with that 15. 
the line I'm going to suggest is a copolymer line called P-Line CXX. It's a high abrasion, extra strength line. The 12 pound literally breaks at around 14 pounds of strength. The stuff's tough as nails. Uh, it's affordable. You really can't go wrong. They're getting started. So that's a good combo for you guys to get it off with. Hang with us, guys. We'll be right back. Did you know that P-Line makes specialized lines for all your fishing needs? From the super strong abrasive resistant CXX or the low stretch super stealthy CX Premium. Or maybe you're looking for invisibility or super bite detection with P-Line's 100% fluorocarbon. No matter what your needs, P-Line's got it covered. To find out more, visit P-Line.com. P-Line, baby! Ever try pulling a planer board next to your boat when trolling or fishing from a swift current bank? If not, you're missing out on one of the most phenomenal fish catching machines on the market today. With Yellowbird planer boards pulling your lines perpendicular to your boat, you can't help but catch more fish. Find out more by visiting www.yellowbirdproducts.com. Attention Northern California anglers, have you been to boat country in Escalon? With one of the largest selections of welded aluminum fishing boats from Weldcraft, Low, and Hughescraft, chances are they've got the right fishing boat for you. And did I mention they have a full service center to take care of all your boating, repair, and maintenance? needs if you're a boat owner or just looking to become one you owe it to yourself to check these guys out visit boatcountryusa.com or stop on by i'll see you there hey guys did you know that yours truly is now hosting lucky tackle boxes monthly pan fish instructionals and aside from relentless fish catching i'll be breaking down the rigging and the gear you need to get going along the way and of course a few extra tips to help you score more fish on the goodies included in your box so remember the tug is our drug so go visit luckytacklebox.com and get signed up today this is in my top five questions that I receive over and over and over. Can I connect a snap swivel to my lure? I generally always say no, it's a bad idea. It's going to negatively affect the action of your lure. And you don't want to do that. You generally want to tie directly on the line to the eye of that lure. Oftentimes, I don't even tie on the split rings. I'll do a loop knot, but I don't get into that. If you're using a snap swivel on a lure, there are some snaps that have a little corner in them. Never ever use those. There are some snaps that are rounded where if you're gonna connect it into your eye, it's round, will allow your lure to still move on there. If you're gonna use one, use one with a rounded area to where your bait doesn't get caught into a corner, just a nice rounded surface there. The downside is you're adding weight to the front of your lure, you're adding more mechanical parts to the front of that lure. So you're gonna have potentially more errors, your lure is going to run incorrectly more often. So tie directly if you can. If you have a big lure and a small snap swivel, not bad at all. Big lures got such a strong action, you probably won't affect it negatively. Smaller lures, never ever use snap swivels. Never ever on small lures. Unless they're way up your leader and you're tying still a line on here, don't connect it directly on a small lure. It's gonna mess you up, I promise you. Another one I commonly get is, I'm not getting any bites. What, what do I do if I'm not getting any bites? <laughs> you know, it sounds funny and I think it's funny, trust me. Uh, I've been there myself, okay? If you're not getting any bites, you, you either are out on a very bad day, but I tell people, don't focus on, on don't focus in, on being a bad day. Oh, it's just, it's just bad out here. There's always a way to get a, a couple fish, you know, whether they're small fish or big fish, there's always a way to get a bite. If you keep it in your mind that there's always a way to catch them, you'll constantly learn. And let me explain something to you. If you say they're just not biting today, what have you done? You've given up. Okay, if you're really into angling and you want to get into fishing, you want to learn how to catch them, that does absolutely nothing for you. Don't give up, and I'm sure you've heard that before. Don't give up in fishing. And it's honest to God truth. I have been out fishing seven hours and I dedicated myself for eight hours. And I'm like, man, it's getting frustrating. I'm doing everything I can. And then all of a sudden, I placed the bait in a particular spot, retrieved it a certain way, and bam, I caught one. And I said, whoa, dad, check this out. I just got a good one doing this. And I go, okay, well, I repeat it, go a little bit down the bank, and I, here's the same scenario. I do it again, and bam, I catch another one. And it was that clue, and yeah, maybe I only caught two fish that day, but it only took two casts. And yes, I may have been mind blowing the whole rest of the day, but if I don't try different things, you don't try different lures, don't try retrieving things differently, don't try different areas of the lake, fish docks, fish deep stuff, fish rocks, fish everything you can with every lure in your tackle box, slow, fast. If you're not continuously trying, you might as well just stop. 
fishing can be very frustrating if you don't think they're biting. Don't ever tell yourself that. Some days they bite better than others, sure. Prefrontal days they bite great. Uh, Postfrontal, not as great. I would expect 10 times as many bites prefrontal. If the storm's coming the day before the storm, I would expect a lot of bites. Uh, day after the storm, I wouldn't expect as many bites. So if you keep that in your mind, you know, only expect to get a few. Say, I'm gonna go out there, I'm gonna focus, give it everything I got, and if I get a few, I'm gonna be real happy. All I'm looking for is just a couple of bites. And then when you start doing better, your morale's gonna go up. If you're fishing positive, it's good. It's gonna pay off. Fishing positive is huge. As soon as you get upset in the boat, it's all gonna fall apart. So keep that in mind, guys. If you're not getting any bites, try everything. Pull up, try a new location. If you're, unless you're fishing for a scavenger species where you need to soak bait out there and hope they come to you, I would honestly say give an hour in that spot. If you don't get bit, pull up and go to another spot. Um, if you're fishing for like bass, if you're fishing for crappie, for bluegill, I don't spend more than 15 minutes in a spot before I jump ship and I'm out of there. You know, and if I've gone through a couple of spots where I'm like, man, I should have got bit, I'm at that point, I'm jumping through everything I have, slowing down, speeding up, changing my cadence, shaking it, bobbing it, shaking it, bobbing it, until I figure out what they want. I think I'm getting another fish or I'm on a rope. Darn it, let me get that off. But that's the answer to that question, guys. Okay, guys, now another common question I get is what pound line should I start off with or what type of line should I start off with without actually the fish part being mentioned. So if I'm gonna just cover an outline right here. If you're fishing for panfish, uh, I'm a P-line guy. Start off with six pound line or four pound line, depending on it. You know, if you like to take your time, uh, I fish two and four pound line primarily. So I would say start off with four pound if you're fishing for uh, crappie, bluegills, red ears, start off with four pound. If you're fishing for monster red ears or monster crappie, go with six pound. I say use a casting like fluorocarbons fluoroclear. Um, that's what I use the majority of the time. Um, if you're fishing for trout, I say start off with six pound, unless you're fishing for big trout, um, bigger, meaner trout, or you're fishing a river, then go to like eight pound. Um, I like to fish uh, CX Premium by P-Line. It's a thinner diameter for trout. I like to really finesse them. And when I'm getting into that bigger line, I like a thinner line diameter and the stuff to cast even further. So the CX Premium is really awesome. Uh, from there, for bass, I already mentioned the 12 pound CXX. If you're just getting started, that's a good versatile one. Unless you're around the big giant bass, then 15 pound CXX. Uh, from there, I would say walleye, I would do about the same. Uh, musky, I'm probably fishing like the same type of stuff I would, oh, just miss one. For musky and those guys, I would jump up into like my catfish caliber lines, my 20 pound CXX or my 25 pound CXX at that point. Uh, but those are good ones to get started off with. Now for your type of line, there's a, there's a bunch of different types of lines out there. You know, eventually, uh, back in the past, we all fished monofilament, which is a nylon line okay nowadays most monofilaments on the market are extrusion so they're they're copolymer lines which are mixtures of nylon types of lines and fluorocarbon crystals now to give it the invisible coating on the line so there's braid uh, we'll call copolymer lines mono lines we'll put them in the same category um, so just get used to that terminology when i say copolymer think of a floating line a more affordable line and a more versatile type of line there's multiple different types low stretch extra stretch thin invisible types copolymer fits a lot of that category uh, fluorocarbon is a inv invisible line with super super low stretch it's a dense line it gets you extra bites, it's very sensitive, it's a lot harder to work with than copolymer line, and it's a little bit more pricey, but as you become higher up in the fishing game, you're looking for extra sensitivity at long cast, you're looking for sensitivity fishing down deeper, fluorocarbon could get you an extra bite as well. That might be a choice for you. Braid, um, if I'm fishing a topwater lure, I'm fishing braid 100% of the time. Braid has virtually zero stretch. It's super, super strong. 12 pound diameter braid equivalent to a 12 pound line is 50 pound braid. It's 50 pound strength. And that's for the most companies. The majority of the companies are right at 50 pound, 15 pound diameter, 65. So you can get a really, really strong line by going braid. What you give up is cushion, 
you don't have cushion so if you're fishing for a fish with a really light mouth that braid's probably going to rip it loose unless you put a leader on there uh, to give them some sort of cushion like a copolymer leader with a little stretch in there um, so and also it's not invisible it's highly visible to where if you have fish with big eyes like tuna or something you're fishing offshore you don't want to use braid they'll see it they won't bite it fluorocarbon you get more bites more sensitive low stretch copolymers you're going to get stretch it's more affordable braid you get no stretch you get super strong strength and it's not uh, very stealthy so keep that in mind what knot should i be tying and i understand a lot of people just getting into fishing i don't want to teach you 10 20 different knots I know 26 off the top of my head that I can do, but I've been fishing my whole entire life and I fish for everything. You don't need to know all that. Uh, plain and simple, if you're using braid or a copolymer line, learn the Palomar, okay? The difference is with braid, it's very slick, no stretch, so it can slip when you're fastening the Palomar knot. And I'll put the illustration for the Palomar right here. You can pause that if you need to and, and watch it back and practice it, which I suggest you do if you don't know it. Once you fasten the Palomar, give your main line a couple of pops. One, two, three. Don't kill yourself and dig the line into your fingers it can cut you because it's thin oh oh tanked right there look at that dog so when you uh when you fasten down on a palomar and pop the line like that uh oh he's in my other line is he tangled up no i got him free when you fasten down on a palomar you want to give that line a couple of pops that's a nice, another nice big red here. If you give the line a couple of pops, it's gonna help it from, it's gonna prevent it from slipping out. Cause if you fasten it and you don't pop it, potentially there could be a little bit of gap in your line. And once the fish grabs it and runs, you may have not fastened it down all the way. So those pops are really gonna help you out. So give it those pops and leave your tagging. Your tagging is that extra leftover piece that you're gonna cut off. Leave it, instead of like super, super small, leave almost up to a quarter of an inch. Oftentimes it doesn't matter. If you're using braid anyways, it's visible. Uh, leaving a quarter inch tag in is gonna help that line and that knot from pulling out on you. So keep that in mind when you're doing it. Uh, the knot you wanna use for copolymer and braid is, is that, uh, geez, I'm just getting lit up over here, is that Palomar knot, my goodness. I cannot keep these fish off. So that's what you want to use Palomar for your copolymers and your braids. For fluorocarbon, I use the clinch knot. I'll use the clinch knot and improve clinch knot strictly because fluorocarbon's dense. And the Palomar, Palomar knot cinches back in on itself. There's gonna, wow, another giant. There's gonna be some people who are gonna argue with me that, wow, popped right out of his mouth. There's some people that are gonna argue that you can do the Palomar just fine with fluorocarbon and you're not going to have a problem. But if you do the Palomar knot incorrectly, look at that, that's a giant bluegill. It's not even a right here. Oh my goodness. Woohoohoo! Beautiful fish. If you do the Palomar knot incorrectly with fluorocarbon, it actually weakens the line strength to where. If you got 10 pound, I mean, you can literally weaken it to like four or five pound if you fasten that knot incorrectly. So do the clinch knot or the improved clinch knot. I'll put the illustration over here. Very basic, simple knot to get started off with. Um, a lot of people ask, can I do that knot with braid? Yes, you can. Leave the longer tag in and pop it. I just got hit over here again, but hopefully those knot tips really help you guys out. Hang with us guys, we'll be right back. Oh, you heard they got weapons of big fish destruction? Well, you heard right. Biwa Fishing Performance is the newest company hit the U.S. market by storm. With some of the sickest swim baits around and non-cookie cutter style lures that you could ever get your hands on, it's time to show these fish something new. Visit Biwa.com. Are you into diving, surfing, or fishing? And have you checked out the Salt Life YouTube channel yet? From awesome surfing insight to scuba diving locations and in and offshore fishing, bundled up with all sorts of crazy cool footage, the Salt Life has you ocean lovers covered. So go check out their YouTube channel and tell them if sent you. 
Have you been to RustyLures.com? Did you know they offer free shipping on anything over $29.99? And with all the latest and greatest in bass fishing gear from punching tackle, umbrella rigs, swim baits, and you name it, there's really no reason for you not to be getting the best deal online today. So go to www.RustyLures.com. Did you ever wish for an RC boat when you were a kid? And do you have a passion for fishing? Well, guess what? It's time to do them both at the same time. With RCFishingWorld.com's RC Fishing Pole, it's time to be a kid again. So visit www.rcfishingworld.com today. Okay, here's a popular one. Lure color. You know, what to use, when to use it. And here's a general rule. If the water's dirty, um, I'm using a solid dark color. Or I'm using a very, very bright color. Like an orange, a yellow, a bright red. Um, or I'm going to a solid dark blue or a black something that I know is going to stand out. Brighter colors, they can't see as far in the water column. They can't see it, but when it gets close, they see that bright color stand out. Uh, for example, the lighter colors like red, underwater bass, I mean fish in general, can only see red from roughly 10 to 15 feet away that the color red shows up. Otherwise, it's like a neutral gray, but a lot of the time that color whoop, appears to them at the last second. Um, I haven't done this study personally, but I've researched it, and this is a scientific proof of that, in case you're wondering. Uh, the darker colors, your dark blues, your dark greens, your blacks, they stand out and show a perfect silhouette from a further distance. Or if you're trying to draw that fish, or if you're trolling and that water's dirty, go with a darker solid color. Or if you see them on your graph and you want to come right through the middle of them, use a brighter color. It might pop and it might appear and it might trigger those fish into striking at that moment. <coughs> if the water is clear you generally always want to go with natural looking colors lighter browns emerald greens something with a little nickel in it something that looks realistic to where if they come up and analyze it they might eat it uh, you want to go with that realistic okay um, so that's basic color choices right there for water clarity now a lot of the time you want to match the hatch let's say if you're fishing around and, and the bass or the pike or whatever you're fishing for in that area or eating shad. Well, naturally, you want to use a bait that looks like a shad. You want something with a lot of nickel chrome flash to it. Um, for that matter, if you're fishing an area that's around rocks and you know the fish are eating crawdads, um, you know, later in the year, crawdads are dark blue. In the hot summertime, they're bright red. Um, earlier in the year, they're brown. So by having that color selection to go with, like if you pick, pick up a jig earlier in the year, you might want to try brown. Uh, later in the winter, you might want to try black and blue. And then earlier into the spring, early spring, mid-spring, you might want to try that brown. Later in the spring, early summer, you might want to try that black and red uh, to better match the hatch at that point. That's the easy thing, matching the hatch. But going outside and saying, ah, this water's dirty, I'm just going to go with the bright color, oftentimes is hard for people to do. But a lot of times, that's what it takes. If you're moving a bait fast, a bright color, a lot of the time they're strictly reacting to it. If you have a fast moving bait and that water's dirty, pick up a couple of bright colors, something like fire tiger or pure chartreuse or a bright yellow and burn it through there and watch, you will catch fish. But clear days, slower moving lures, natural, natural, natural. Always go with that natural. The cleaner the water gets, the more natural you wanna be. One thing you wanna keep in mind, if you're using a worm, Okay, and that water is crystal clear, don't use one with the little flakes in it that are shiny. They don't like shiny worms in clear water. So keep that in mind, guys. Okay, guys, when to retie a lure. I probably should have retied both of these already, and I'll probably learn my lesson. I'll probably hook some three-pound shell cracker and snap myself off. It's You need to keep in mind that big fish during that fight are going to fatigue that knot. So basically I caught a couple fish on each of these already. Uh, one of them's two pound, the other's four pound line. So the knots are fatigued, okay? I've been putting my drag real light, so I'm not too worried about it. If you find yourself hanging up and like popping your line free of things and a lot of tension developing, I tell people keep a general rule of practicing. If you're fishing the same lure all day, Tell yourself you're going to cut it off at least five to six times and you're going to retie it back on throughout that day. If you tell yourself you're going to do that, 
you're naturally going to get into the rhythm of doing that and it's going to protect you when it comes time to hook a big fish or you manage to hook one and you're like you know what i retied 20 minutes ago i got a strong knot you boat flipped that big fish hey nothing bad happened you're fishing around docks, you're fishing around rocks, that line is fatiguing down and around that knot. You're ramming it into things. If you catch a few quality fish, your line's gotten slapped, the hook set's been hard, or you threw a frog up into the bank and slam, you slammed them on the hook set and got them to the boat. Anytime you catch a big quality fish, cut off, retie. Anytime you find yourself hung in rocks and you pop it out, even though you check the line for abrasion, cut it off and retie. It's gonna end up saving you a big fish, trust me. When to use smaller baits. And I'm assuming that they meant, let's say I'm fishing a, a big old crankbait and now I'm gonna drop down to a tiny worm or a tiny jerk bait. When to fish smaller baits? Well, if you're fishing a big bait and you're not getting bit, you're fishing a big bait, you're generally searching for larger fish, therefore the numbers are fewer. Uh, there's always going to be a lot more smaller fish of the particular species you're fishing for so your bite ratio will increase if you switch to a smaller lure because you're fishing for a higher quantity of fish a bigger volume of fish the bigger lure you have you're fishing for a bigger fish but you're catching less but let's say when to switch and that's not the real answer for when to switch when to switch is when plain and simple you can't get bit or you notice there's fish activity a lot of fish activity around you and, and you're fishing a particular lure and that fish is uh you know it, it's a big fish that you see blasting on that bait and you're like well how come i'm not getting bit well maybe the forge that they're they're blasting on is you know a minnow that's this big or a shad that's this big you know a lot of the time if you can't catch that bait or analyze it Start assuming that maybe it's a shad, maybe it's smaller, and then to start jumping through smaller baits at that point. That can help you get on them. I recently did a last episode, um, Casting Tips and Fall Delta Tricks. I'll put the link right here at the bottom. If you check that out, that scenario actually applies. I was fishing bigger baits, but I do a trick when the stripers trap the shad up against the banks. The shad in my area are generally about this big. I'll look at them from time to time. I'll see when fish spit them up in my live well and look at the size of the shad. Well, I had to pull out a tiny, tiny jerk bait to match up to the right size bait. Once I did that, I had no problem at all smashing the bass. But my bigger jerk bait, they wanted nothing to do with. So a lot of the time, when to switch to a smaller bait is where maybe you actively see fish feeding on smaller bait or you're just not getting the right bites if you're looking to get quantity over quality dropping down always helps man they keep smacking that boy i'm gonna whip out this marker float i got over here somewhere where'd you go on me oh it's over there hold on guys yeah. marker float to the rescue well, let's hope i don't tangle any of my lines with that Throwing that out there, I get a much better idea of where I drifted through and I was getting a lot of bites. Um, I didn't have it out earlier, that's why. Uh, but switch in those smaller baits. If you're not getting bit, drop down in size or try a different lure entirely. Try to change up your retrieval speed. But smaller bites is when, smaller baits is when you are looking for smaller fish, more fish, the majority of fish, not necessarily trophies. If you don't have any fish in the boat and you're fishing a tournament, you got an hour or two left, you might want to switch to a smaller bait and fish for a larger quantity of fish and get five of those and weigh in five okay ones instead of one or two giant ones. Or you could just go for the win like I do. <laughs> just kidding. My three favorite lures for fishing small ponds in regards to bank fishing. This is surprisingly pretty common question. Um, I would say a five inch stick worm, like a Bass Pro Shop Sticko or a Senko or a Ninja Stick, any, any stick worm, any chopstick style worm, Texas rigged, weightless. Most ponds are not that deep, so if I cast out into the middle, I'm patient enough to count to 10 seconds to make sure my bait gets across the bottom. 
Um, a Texas rig is versatile enough where I can throw it in the grass, let it sink in the grass, throw it around rocks, let it sink to the rocks, and it's weedless for the most part to where I can drag it across most of the cover or structure that's out there. If there's a creek channel, I can throw it, let it get down into the creek channel. From there, I like a topwater frog, a hollow body frog. Um, to be able to throw over grass mats, to be able to throw over the top of leaves or a snotty corner in a lake. To where I can throw it over the top, that fish can blow up, I can hook them, get them out of there. I could skip it under a boat dock and get them out of there. Um, from there, I would honestly say a jig. A jig gets me bigger bites. I could throw a jig under a dock. I could throw it into a tree. I could throw it around the same spots where I fish that Texas rig and get a bigger fish to trigger. It falls faster, it's heavier, I can cast it further. So the jig, the five inch Texas rig worm, and a frog. Um, you know, if I were gonna replace the jig and not look for the big bite and just go to a pond to have a lot of fun and catch a lot of fish, I would add the wacky rig, probably a trick worm, a lighter wacky rig, like the five inch zoom trick worms on like a little size 1.0 mosquito hook or a size one mosquito hook with that wacky rig hook right in the middle. Weightless, throw it out there, let it fall. I can catch a lot of fish, not necessarily looking for the giants, but looking for more quantity. Okay, how does water temperature affect fish? I'm not gonna say it's a common one, but this is one that people should know. Uh, I'm gonna go from how it affects them in the summertime, how it affects them in the wintertime, and the transitions around that. In the spring, they're coming from winter, the colder water temperature, some fish do fine in cold water, uh, but it slows the majority of fish down. And we're talking freshwater fish, not necessarily saltwater fish here. Um, in the wintertime, the metabolism of the fish is slower. A lot of the forage ducks in for the winter, crawdads are hunkered down. Everything slows down. Um, so how that affects the fish is a lot of the times they're looking for a very small, simple, slower meal. Or they're looking for one very large meal to sustain them. Uh, this is why a lot of the time the bass fishing guys, you'll see us fishing big swim baits in the winter time because a bass is willing to eat that one giant meal to hold him over for a week or two weeks. They're looking for that giant meal. Um, therefore, that giant bass will eat during the winter time. Um, in the spring, as the water starts to warm, once it gets around 60 degrees, the bass are gonna start moving up into the shallows and roaming around looking to spawn. Uh, the bluegills are gonna start becoming more active. The crawdads are gonna start moving out of the mud, coming out, getting active to where that life cycle is becoming more active in the spring once that water temperature is nearing that 60 degrees. Um, the bass start looking to spawn around there. They start feeding up real heavy. Uh, the bluegills start feeding up real heavy a little bit while the bass are spawning. The bass spawn, then the bluegill spawn, and the crappie spawn even before the bass. Um, spotted bass spawn even before the crappie, and sometimes dead in the middle of winter, spotted bass and smallmouth spawn. Um, so that goes to show you smallmouth and spotted bass aren't affected by the cold nearly as much as a largemouth bass for that matter. So that's a big effect from water temperature. Um, all the way into the mid 70s, the majority of life is gonna eat really good around the spring. Once that water starts getting hotter, the, the bite can slow down, some places not necessarily, but the, once it gets hotter, it kind of has the same effect. That water temperature getting hot has the same effect as that water temperature getting cold that they don't want to exert a lot of energy. So maybe they want small meals again, or maybe they want large meals again, or are fishing for them in the thicker, heavier cover to where they're trying to avoid that sun at that point. And that's due to hot water temperature. Once again, as the water starts to drop down in temperature nearing the fall, the bait's going to move back into those creeks. It's going to move around the creek mouths. It's going to let those bass and other fish know, hey, it's time to feed up. Those trout are going to go gorge themselves on minnows and shad. The bass are going to gorge themselves on minnows and shad. Walleye need it be. Um, they're going to get there. They're going to eat a lot because they know winter's coming. As that water temperature gets cold again, those fish are going to slow down. They're going to look for smaller, easier meals or the bigger meal to hold them over for a certain matter of time. So hopefully that helps you better understand how that water temperature affects them. Oh, side note. If we have a cold night come in the middle 
of the summer. A lot of the time that extra cold night coming is a front. So prefrontals, always good. Postfrontal, not so good. So keep that in mind. Um, in the winter time, if we have a warming trend, sometimes the bass will come up into the shallows and eat all of a sudden. That's kind of like an adverse effect to a front in the winter time. We have like a warming front to where the bass will move up and become active at that time to where if you see we have a hot day on the schedule, go on that hot day in the winter time and you can get those fish actively feeding on that particular day because it's gonna warm the water up by a few degrees. Focus on rock, concrete areas, gravel, shallow areas at that time where that water temperature is gonna jump, you know, four to 10 degrees possibly during that warming trend and you can catch active fish even in those cold times of year. What is a thermocline? It's funny, you know, when, when guys are in the beginning stages of fishing, they could care less about what a thermocline is. And then once you guys start learning a little bit more about it, like one of the first technical terms people learn is thermocline. And all thermocline is, is water stratification. If you imagine the waters in layers, like a cake, bing, 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 different layers, okay? Thermoclines can happen throughout the year. The most common ones are in the winter and summer. What happens is it's when there's layers of different water temperatures and different layers for better oxygen levels. A lot of the time in the winter time, there's this certain layer of water. Need it be 20 feet down, in between 20 and 30 feet, there's that perfect water layer where the oxygen level and the bait's living in. And if you go out and you use your fish finder and you look in the wintertime or the summertime, a lot of the time you'll see that the bait is in between like a certain depth, like from 30 to 45 feet. And you're like, wow, I don't see any sort of bait or any sort of fish outside that depth. Well, what's going on is they're in that thermocline. They're in that water stratification layer where the oxygen and everything's just perfect. You got low oxygen down here, the water on top's too hot, and there's that happy, comfortable medium for them, that thermocline. And how you can use it to your advantage is you can look on your map and you can see that there's ledges down deep that happen to fit right where that thermocline is. And leaving the boat ramp, you saw that there was bait in that particular depth in nowhere else. So now you can say, oh, they were in 30 to 40 feet. Well, now I'm gonna look for ledges and humps and points that come up in between 30 and 40 feet. And guess what? You can pull up on a hump, right? That fits right into that criteria. There's bait all over it and there's fish actively feeding over it versus a hump that was too deep or too shallow. So that exists during the summertime and it exists during the winter time. That's your thermocline. It's that happy layer that fits in between the surface layer and the winter. Now people are gonna say the turnover, the spring turnover, the fall turnover. And what that is, is when, let's say you have a cool layer in the middle, that thermocline that they liked uh, during the summertime. Well, what happens is the fall comes around, it's getting cold at nighttime. Now all of a sudden that surface layer becomes colder than the thermocline, that happy medium layer. Now the water rotates. Now that surface layer comes down and shifts with that happy medium layer. That's a turnover. It mixes up all the bad oxygen, mix it up decomposition stuff that's decomposing down there. It mixes it up. The lakes get dirty. The bait fish start going crazy. That's a turnover. It happens in the spring and it happens in the fall. So keep it in mind, guys. You can use it to your advantage and that is what they're talking about. What is barometric pressure? Basically, it's the pressure of the air. When you see a clear, clear sky, you know the barometer is way up, the pressure is there. What is, what is this to fish, to the water? Basically, if you look at a high pressure day, okay, clear skies, the barometer's way up, it's not dropping, it's not falling. It's like putting a weight on your shoulders, okay? It's like asking you to put on a backpack with 100 pounds and telling you to run down the street and grab a meal. So when it's high pressure, a lot of time you have to fish slower. You, you need to fish tighter, fish tighter together, you know, strictly to increase your chances because the fish oftentimes on high pressure hunker down. Uh, they get into that thick cover. They don't really want to run down a meal. Their strike zone shrink, shrinks down. So, and then when the barometer's falling, people say, oh, the barometer's falling low pressure well look outside clear high pressure overcast heavy clouds 
barometer's falling. If it's heavy overcast, it's raining, it's super gray skies, it's low pressure. It's like taking a weight off of those fish. So a lot of the times when it's real overcast or pre throttle the barometer's falling, okay? And it's basically like taking the backpack full of weight off of these fish and saying, now go grab me a meal. Well, now they're 10 times more likely to go grab a meal. They're gonna start actively feeding. The barometer's falling, the weight's been lifted off of them. They're gonna run down lures from further away. They're gonna feed more actively because they don't feel that pressure on them. Now it's becoming easier for them. They just put on a brand new pair of shoes. They just got their workout on. They did a few push-ups. They're ready to run down some fish and eat them at that point with that barometer. Gray skies, real overcast, low pressure system, good fishing, higher, brighter, clear skies, bluebird days, high pressure, slow down, fish tighter, fish heavier, to fish near cover more, slow it down, fish more methodical, and you'll catch more fish. Adjusting to that, that's that barometer, that's your barometric pressure for you in a simple outline. Last but not least, before we wrap this up here, I get this question, are red hooks, do red hooks really, really help? Well, what, what does red signify to a fish? What is red on a fish, what is red that lives in its environment? Um, red is a sign of calcium. Crawdad shells turn red. Um, gill plates are red. So if you keep that in mind, let's say you have a red hook near the front of your bait. You have a, a lure and it's got two hook placements right here for treble hooks. And you have a red one in the front. Well, it means if the bass or walleye or pike or anything's coming up to it and they see red, the only time they would see red on a bait fish is when their back is turned to them. That means, hey, hey, guess what? We got a good opportunity to ambush this fish because he's not looking at us. We're coming up from behind, we see red. Um, some people say blood. I don't think so. How many fish do you see swimming around bleeding on a regular basis? They don't. You see gill plates, those are red. Crawdads are red. Um, maybe some fish have red in them. I don't see that very often. But what it signifies is gill plates. More often than not, I think it means gill plates. So if you put a red hook on the back, you're getting them to strike at the back of your lure, potentially miss. If you have the option to put red, put it near the head of your bait. Seriously, put it near the front of your bait so they will strike the meat in potatoes and not miss. If you're gonna do a red hook, put it on the front of your bait. That's all you need to do. Hopefully you guys appreciated this film. Um, I had fun making it out here, drifting, uh, just catching panfish, talking to you guys about this stuff. Uh, check out informativefisherman.com. Visit my Facebook, Informative Fisherman, Informative Fisherman, my Instagram, my uh, Twitter. I don't really use, but I'm doing Periscope videos now at Info Fisherman. So hit me up on there, guys. Write me some more questions. Maybe I'll do another one of these episodes later on in life. I'm going to be doing this for a long, long time. I'm not leaving you guys stranded. I promise you that. More awesome fishing episodes coming up where we're out with pros. But greatly appreciate you guys watching. We'll see you next time.